Hi everyone, hello and welcome to today's webinar, um, Designing Great Interactive Smart Communities Using Cedar Learn, IBIPSA USA, presented by Dr. Zoltan Negi. Uh, my name is Sasha and I would like to welcome you all. Today's session will be recorded and available on demand. If you have any hearing issues um, about the presentation, please try calling in instead of using computer audio. Uh, additionally, please participate in today's session. So this is a Zoom webinar, as you all know, so you will be muted and off camera during the session, but enter any comments into the chat. So by default, it is set to send to just the presenters. So be sure to click the down arrow next to the chat and select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to see your comment or question. We welcome your questions, thoughts, and ideas as we continue to work towards IBIPSA's USA's mission um, of fostering better buildings through simulation. Uh, if you don't, if you do have any question again, um, you can just type it in the chat. And at the end of this presentation, I'll unmute our audience on Zoom for a discussion with Dr. Negi. And now I would like to introduce him um, as my former um, PhD advisor, Dr. Negi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin, directing the Intelligence and uh, Environments Lab since 2016. Um, his PhD in robotics turned building engineers and his research interest area in smart buildings and cities, renewable energy systems, control systems for zero emissions, building operations, and the application of machine learning and artificial intelligence for the built environment, for a sustainable energy transition. Uh, he has received lots of awards, including the Outstanding Research Awards from IBIPSA USA in 2022. And he also received several Best Paper Awards from CISPOT Conference and um, Building Environment, uh, Environment Journal, as well as a highest cited paper award from Applied Energy. He also organized and chaired the first workshop on reinforcement learning for energy management in buildings and cities at uh, ACM BuildSys 20. Thank you, Zoltan, for being here today. Thank you, Aisha, for the, for the nice introduction. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for attending uh, this presentation. Um, I will, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about green interactive communities. I have about three parts. And the first part is slightly like a motivation why we're doing what we're doing. The middle part is some results of our recent works. Um, not very technical, more like general, you know, results. Um, and then the last part is sort of like recent novelty, next steps, current events, all kinds of the goodness that, that happened in the last couple of weeks um, that are not the general uh, presentation. Um, so, as Aisha said, we are working on many cool things. It's a lot related about data science, energy, and the built environment. The main two foci that we have, um, intelligent, so, so some kind of smartness, some kind of algorithms that make decisions. Um, and then the other one is human responses to dealing with people. And so that's kind of like what we're trying to, to address. And the reason we do that, um, hopefully I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, um, you know, buildings consume a lot of electricity. Um, in the US, but worldwide. As a result, you know, a lot of our emissions are related uh, from the built environment, coming from the built environment, mostly for conditioning space, heating and cooling. And so, as you know, this will not go away. Um, places that are hot will get warmer. Um, so your cooling loads will increase. Places that are cold may get warmer, but it doesn't mean that you know, things will get better because we are also trying to electrify heating. And so in that case, your, your heating loads will go up and that will add additional stress to the grid. So we know what we need to do, right, to, to decarbonize the built environment, which is cleaning up the grid. Uh, on one hand, I will not talk about that part, but we'll talk about, um, you know, how we can use electricity um, on the other hand, on the end users, right? So when we do that, when we creating a clean grid, as you're probably aware of, we'd run into another issue if you just keep adding solar onto the grid and and uh, wind, which is that the energy will be not generated at the time when you need it. And so we need to work on a, you know addressing the flexibility. Uh, we need to address this mismatch between uh, demand and supply. 
And so my work is mostly around that topic, I'm trying to do it on like a daily basis. So I'm not talking about seasonal storage, I'm talking about how we can use electricity when we need it and store it when we don't need it in a way that we don't, uh, you know, waste energy and you know, also we don't sacrifice, let's say comfort and, and you know, we don't have blackouts. Um, and I wanna focus on one specific group of buildings, which is, single family homes or residential homes in general, they make up a large part um, of, of the residential buildings in the US. And so what I'm trying to work on, trying to understand is this is a huge potential. Like I said, right, buildings are a big part. And then so you drill down the single family homes are rather big part. So so that that is, I would call an untapped potential to address this flexibility because they're big consumers throughout the day. The big problem is, right, that that uh, every building is different and they're all over the place and people are different. And so that's kind of like the challenge that we have uh, with, you know, very hard problem, but potentially a big payoff if we can manage to address all of these loads. So that brings us to, um, you know, individual buildings are not interesting. You want to group them together, right? There should be many, many buildings. That's why we talk about communities. So you, you look at the aggregated response of many communities. And so grid interactive communities, you talk about those because you want to have some sort of support for the grid. And it, the term is not very defined. It's very fluent. Um, and so, so, you know, whatever it can mean in the sense that it's reacting or, you know, proactively managing some sort of feedback from the grid. Um, when you look at, you know, what DOE calls grid interactive energy efficient buildings, it, it generally goes this way. So the buildings as a community can be made more efficient, right? So you use use less energy to do the same or you do more with less so that's kind of like the idea your daily load throughout the day uh, or, or your, your energy throughout the day doesn't change in terms of its shape but you know you use less so that's being more efficient that does not address the problem of you know shifting loads and using them uh, when you when you don't have the renewables next step um, you you, you add solar, which is what we know, which is what generates a duck curve. When you have too much solar, you have too much generation throughout the day, you get negative prices, nobody wants it. It's basically useless if you have very high penetration. You can end up with challenges on the grid if you have too much solar. So it's kind of like, you know, inefficient use in some sense. And then at the end of the day, when all the solar goes away, you have a huge spike um, and big ramping problem which needs to be compensated. And so that, that's a secondary challenge here that we have. And so ideally what we want is this third, which is we are relatively free to use and to store energy throughout the day. And that brings us to this concept of uh, grid interactive energy efficient buildings as um, the DOE calls it, um, which has this blue curve here, which is you know more or less constant, ideally almost constant throughout the day because that's very predictable then, right? But it has to be really constant, doesn't matter. Um, but the idea is that you may use more throughout the day here because you can store it, but then you can use it later uh, in the evening to release it um, and then, you know, be able to, to avoid all the peaks and to reduce overall the energy use. And so this is like the setting. So I'm talking, how can we achieve this sort of behavior, that blue curve with residential buildings. So those are two themes together, right? Not commercial, not big consumers, but the aggregated response of individual individualized buildings. Obviously we need, oh yeah, sometimes it's called smart homes, uh, but whatever smart means, that that's what it should mean. So obviously what we need or what, what I'm talking about or what we'll be talking about is, is uh, we need some sort of storage for this to happen and we need some sort of control. So that's the big pillars of this presentation, right? Using storage and using it in a smart way, which is how we control it. Um, pretty agnostic in terms of what storage we can use. So a lot of the work later that I'll be talking about is electric batteries, so electrical battery storage. Um, we have done similar work uh, with thermal storage, assuming it have a chilled water or a hot water tank. Um, so, so it is not it is agnostic to that. Any any of these would technically work to explore, you know, these capabilities. <laughs> so that's for that. Like I said, a lot of the work I'm showing later is electric um, electric storage, like batteries. In terms of control, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. So that's where my focus is in my group. Like I said, we're working on intelligent systems. So part of that is, is control. And so when you look at it, 
you really have sort of three main groups, uh, you know, without starting a, a war on what is best, but like a, sort of like a small overview of what, what you have. You have this very traditional rule-based control, uh, which is, you know, sequence of operation. Uh, it's a set of rules. It's very predictable. It's a reactive way of saying if something happens, you do this, right? Very easy to explain, very easy to implement. This is what happens on most uh you know most devices throughout uh, throughout the industry i'm not talking about you know speed control and motors i'm talking more about general set points like high level control um, that that's for this one so rule based control very much used but it's reactive it cannot it does not really do optimal uh, control in a sense and it cannot adapt if you have changes in your in your systems so then there's a big class uh, of controllers that are you know considered optimal, uh, which is a model predictive control uh, approach. Again, many, many subclasses without going into detail on those, but the main idea here is that you have uh, a model, a mathematical model at your disposal that describes the dynamics of your system, in this case, a home or batteries and whatnot. And so using that model and then certain forecasts about the future, like weather, pricing signals, occupancy, et cetera, you can make an optimal, uh, you know, optimal actions into the future and then start going down um, for the next for the next time step, according to that. So the advantage of this is that this is, you know, considered to be the optimal way if you, or you, or your model is perfect, you can, you know, deal with disturbances and so on and, and, and reject those um, very successfully. The main challenge with this one is that you do need a model. So that's something that you have to do. And when you remember, you need to, we're talking about many, many residential homes everywhere. It's kind of individualized, every building's different. So it's kind of hard to come up with not so much the model structure, but you know, system identification and identifying the individual parameters of your model. So that's one of the challenges. The other one is um, that this is an optimal optimization problem at every time step, which is you know not something you really want to do uh, every day, all the time. Uh, hourly or 15 minute basis because it's very computationally expensive and it requires some hard work. So again, you know, a lot of folks working on those challenges. Um, so this is just a high level sort of you know, idea of the main characteristics of, of MPC. Uh, keep in mind optimal control and it, it requires a model. So what we're interested in um, from a from a research perspective and also like how in, you know applicable this is to reality is uh, third class learning based controllers um, such as reinforcement learning. And here the idea is to shift the need to create this model, make it individual, make it a lot more adaptable to the individual context um, at the expense of for example, not being able to make optimal decisions early on, um, but at the at the advantage that you could adapt over time to your particular building, right? So again, a lot of people work on you know a lot of aspects of of RL, and there's a very many different ways of of addressing it. I, I don't want to go too much into detail. If you have never heard of it, the best way to think about it, um, especially the model free versions, is that it's kind of like trial and error. You know, a, a very engineering way. You do something, you learn from it. Your your plant or your system returns a reward signal saying you did well or you didn't do well. And over time, you try to create those best, you know, high reward actions. Um, and so that way, you learn and you adapt to your situation. Um, you can show optimality under certain, you know, conditions. It's not necessary. Or you know, if you're interested in that, I'm not too interested in that. I'm interested in this concept that you can adapt to individual places. And I don't need to create the model. That those two things are the, the nice things. And the challenges we face with that is that we sometimes need a lot of data. And I'll come to that in a second, because you need to learn a lot and explore a lot before you can actually get uh, to something good. So again, there is a lot of algorithms, a lot of papers have been written. Um, if you're interested in the details, we will use the examples I show are called soft actor critic algorithms, which tend to be good for a lot of these, um, you know, little more data efficient. So you can be using them uh, for this particular example. Um, but yeah, if you want more details, I'm happy to chat, but you know, there's a lot have, uh, written about it. If you're really interested in this topic, just this week, we got this paper accepted and put into print. 
Um, so it's about to go online on building an environment that we we try to um, summarize. Uh, we try to do two things. One, just give a summary of what what RL is for the buildings. What's the promise? What can it do? What it cannot do? Contrast with you know RBC, RL, and MPC a little bit. And then the big open questions and then challenges at the end and some sort of like examples that have been done. So it's a bit of a past what has been done, a bit of an inspiration to try it out and then a bit of a like, oh, here are the big problems um, that, that, you know, in, in this field. Okay, so let's, uh, let's roll back a little bit. So remember, we wanted to do control on single family homes. Um, many, many buildings were interested in using RL. Um, and so when I started this work, you know, this is 2016, 2017, um, there was one big problem. This all sounds great, but there was no way to figure out whether or not this could work. And, uh, you know, there's, when I say there was no way, I mean, I mean there was no easy way. So there's, well, there's been some work on creating co-simulation environments. And uh, we did one version of a co-simulation environment and anybody who has worked on those, um, I feel for you, this is very hard. And unfortunately, the end result is that you can use it and it's very hard to replicate it uh, for somebody else. And so when we started, it was very clear that we want to have something that is easy to use and also something that other people can easily use. So there was always a guiding star. So a lot of the decisions we made along the way is something that, you know, this can be easily replicated by others or, or used by others. Uh, much in line with, you know, what, what computer science friends have been doing for a while, like re re release robust data sets, release robust environments that can be picked up. So faced with this, um, there was nothing around. Normally what you've seen, you know, in addition to the co-simulation environments, either there is something very, very detailed on one end, you know, very, very detailed system models on buildings, or, you know, on the other end, you have everything lumped together and it's sort of like a nationwide or, you know, percot wide or grid wide response, which is not what we're looking at, but it's sort of neighborhood scale, you know, 20 buildings, 100 buildings, 150, 10, scale has not been really conquered or there was some gap that, that we wanted to or that we jump into it. Um, so that, that this is our work here that kind of like six in that in that area. So today, um, and I, I didn't put it on the slide, but today, if you wanted to go out, there has been at least two very, very cool other environments that, that you can use. So Ibipsa has been pushing uh, the Bob tests the last two or three years, so building optimization test bed, very cool, runs in the browser integrates um, you know control environment with energy plus and so you can you can do that um, very very easily which is really cool and then um, Greg Hens's group but NREL and also I mean at, 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 in, in Boulder and together with NREL released uh, ACTB advanced control test bed very similar uh, you know uh, co-simulation environment with energy plus and gym and, and all kinds of standard libraries so it's very very cool over the last two or three years an explosion of this this works so it shows it's important and, and people are needing it and the topic itself is not going away um, so that that's kind of like where we're sitting in right now as well right our approach is that we, we, we sacrifice a little bit on accuracy in some sense. We use, uh, you know, physics-based, simple physics-based model, first order models, uh, not detailed, let's say, modelic uh, environments or not as detailed as Energy Plus. Uh, but for that, we, we work, you know, 10, 15 buildings, 20 buildings. And so we can easily integrate those into our workflow. So what it is, um, again, it's a gym environment. OpenAI gym is a standard um, interface or API sort of interface that lets us use standard algorithms, whether it's RL or others, in a way that you know can be replicated or algorithms that have been written by others can be easily addressed um, in, in, the, in the environment, which is good. Um, we didn't want to. We didn't want a user to deal too much with the buildings and the systems and the setup. So essentially, you can just create a config file and say, "Oh, it's a building. You know, it has a certain solar array, it has a certain battery or thermal storage, um, electric storage, and so on, and just configure it." And then the, the models are running in the back. Um, you can use your own buildings to some extent. So all this is a bit of a ongoing work. So you know, we can chat about what's possible. The version that we released um, in 2019, uh, the demand we had was pre-computed, um, which means you couldn't shift thermostat 
set point. So you couldn't do preheating and pre-cooling. So keep that in mind when, when I talk about uh, the results that I'm showing and then also what, what's to come um, soon. Um, there is a, an advantage and a disadvantage to this. The advantage is, well, the disadvantage is you can't look at what uh, you know preheating and pre-cooling can do uh, for, for load shifting. But the advantage is, if you were to have smart meter data from a home, you have your demand. And so now you could see what you know, using storage in that home would do by keeping the, the, uh, the home net load essentially constant or whatever the smart meter is with the assumption that in that case, you're not violating whatever the occupants are wanting. So that's kind of like the idea. And then by abstracting everything into the back end, basically we can focus on the control, which is what, what we wanted to do. Um, to begin with, right? So that was a big focus. Um, and then the last pillar that we also wanted it to be is that it's it's free to use, free to extend, freely accessible. So obviously it's not, you don't have to pay for it, but just use it. Um, and then, you know, somewhat community driven, which, you know, slowly starting over the last year or two. So that's very exciting. And we can talk about that in a little bit. So this was a development, like I said, between 20, 15, 2016, when we released the first version in 2019. So that's a few years ago. And so then, you know, then it's like, okay, well, what do we do now? Um, we have it, we you know, clap on our shoulders, and write the paper and thank you very much, we move on. But of course it's not um, what we wanted to do, but now that we have a nice environment, one thing we can try is to, to you know, think what are the big problems and work on them. So one of the things that I won't show you many results, just a summary, I mentioned is very briefly, one of the things that our al algorithms have is the data efficiency, which is you need quite a lot of data until you converge to some you know, meaningful optimal result as some would call it. That is correct, but the assumption of that statement presumes that you're starting with a completely unknowing framework. Like you can't start from scratch and you don't know anything. However, these are buildings. These are not some robots that try to learn or walk, right? These are buildings. If you're thinking of a battery, if you're thinking of a smart thermostat, if you're thinking of HVAC, you can think of very simple rules that you could set up that you could jumpstart anything that you want. So the idea that you can integrate very, very easily domain knowledge into your system behavior is, is very realistic, right? So again, um, so, so we did that and we explored what if we didn't start from scratch, but what if we started from some simple rules, right? And so it turns out that's amazing. Uh, it's really, really simple. It's very quick. Um, it's almost no comparison anymore. You can jumpstart with, uh, with like some simple rules. It will optimize them over time very quickly and you will end up where you would have ended up if you didn't start it just a lot faster. So that's a really cool result because it lets you you know, deal with that kind of argument very quickly. Well, you can jumpstart with simple results and in buildings, you have those. Um, you know, think of batteries. I will talk about batteries, time of use optimization, put in charge between this and this time, discharge at that and that time. That's not rocket science. That's what we do standard today. And so that's, this is just building on top of that. Uh, two things that, that also came out of it, um, which is you actually don't need a lot of data and sometimes a lot of data can be harmful. Um, that, that talks about data quality um, and we have not explored that further uh, yet, but it, it just you know, raises the question that data qual quantity is not everything. Data quality is a lot better. Some domain knowledge is a lot better. Um, this has been also corroborated recently. I think Dr. Zheng O'Neill's work um, showed that, you know, comparing ASHRAE guideline 36 to some advanced uh, uh, algorithms like MPC or RLC does not give you any advantage. So ASHRAE guideline 36 is really, really good. You just have to implement it, right? And so that, that's kind of like the same idea. If you spend the time to actually implement uh, the, the problem very, very well, or find really, really good rules for that particular building, the smart stuff is not doing a lot more. And that's that's a really good result to know, right? So now the question is where you want to spend your money or how do you want to scale, right? On a commercial large building, it makes sense to tune. But now if you're starting about hundreds of residential homes, you want to go and tune everyone, that's that's a tough challenge, right? And so so that's that's kind of like the challenge that, that where some advanced algorithms can help, which is the scalability, 
right? And so the question that we asked based on or after this was, well, can we do you know, stuff where we have little data from one building where we can learn a little bit and then we put it on some other building so that you know, it can learn from there. So jumpstart one building with another building after jumpstarting it with, with a simpler rules, right? So that's a lot of steps ahead of time, but this is a realistic environment, right? This is you're, you're buying your newer battery and your neighbor has some data and you go to your neighbor and say, well, hey, can I use some of your time series to jumpstart my setup here? And so that it's, it's kind of like better and optimal, right? That's kind of like the idea. And then on top of that, well, can we use that to provide this flexibility that I talked about in the beginning? So can we provide some more sort of flexible uh, operation and more constant load profile, right? So I hope you're not surprised. The answer to that is that we can, um, but I'll show you um, how, or I mean, what, what we did to, to show that. Um, this is the, the paper that this week went into press, so it got accepted. So again, in a few days, you can probably see it online. Um, so what we did here, this in collaboration with EPRI, uh, we got uh, you know smart meter data from one of their demonstrators, one year uh, end use of the, the whole building net load. Uh, we augmented with uh, weather and then some data from the, the utility, like emission in the grid and also the rates. We recreated it. Um, in, in virtually, so some would call it a digital twin. I'm, I'm not going there today, but basically you recreate the same environment and then you do some experiments that I'll talk about. And then technically you could do a return to that neighborhood and implement the rules that we found, but we were not allowed to do that anymore. So, but technically we, we worked out the whole chain in a very sort of like realistic way so that you you gather the data, you do your stuff in the, in, in, in the simulation and then, in a way that it would make sense, we would, would be able to deploy it. Um, a few backgrounds on this neighborhood. It's a, it's a net zero demonstrator built a few years ago. You, the, the, the report came out like five years ago. So it's been a while. Um, a few characteristics was that it was built to very high standards at that time. Uh, so very energy efficient. You know, buildings have battery storage, solar, very good insulation. So by any, typical means is for very, very good buildings already. Um, so it's hard to squeeze out um, any, any advantages. And I, I think the report you can read and it finds that the advantage of electric batteries was not found to be economic. Um, so that was the, the assessment. Then when the batteries were controlled with the time of use rate. And so what we did was to recreate that experiment basically with the same data, with the same rate structure, and then trying to figure out if our advanced algorithms would be able to you know, advance a little bit. And we did this in two steps. So just to have you know, some comparison, the first strategy, this is sort of like to our reference point, um, you know, just running for 12 months the data and optimizing using all the data from the buildings and every building has its own controller and finds the best way um, so this way, it's kind of like our optimal reference or best best performance that's possible. Then we do one that is more realistic uh, in some sort of sense of deployment, basically saying, well, we will train on for five months on this one building, we'd collect that data, and then for the next seven months, we'll deploy that, whatever we trained on the agent, and then we deploy it on the other buildings um, and then see if they can improve on that on those buildings, right? So that's a, that's a realistic, because we don't use past data, we we'll only use a little bit of data and then we look for the next next ways. So that's that. Then I mentioned the rule-based control jump starting. So we, here we used both as a reference, the time of use tariff that was in place at that time. Uh, this is Southern California. Um, and so basically, you know, charging when things are cheap in the morning or early, early, you know, late morning, early afternoon, and then discharging when things are expensive. So it's an economical optimization process. To do that in every building has this goal, right? This is all the all the reference that we're having. And we also use this RBC to jumpstart the, the, the RL controllers because that, that makes things fast. And then we're looking at a few indicators um, that I'll show you. Um, these are the same that EPRI looked at and some that are that, that we were interested in just so we have the same comparison. So net consumption, you know, from the buildings, the cost, the carbon emissions, because you know the carbon content 
um, in the grid. So this is a conversion. I was interested how close we are to zero net energy. It's a tough one and it's a bit of an accounting one, obviously, because over a year it's easy, but over an hour or you know, five minutes, it's a little bit harder. Um, and then I mentioned the grid support. So here we'll look at, uh, you know, like the average daily peak from the aggregated load of the building over this period. And then the ramping, which is the, the one about for the, um, you know, for the duck curve and the load factor, which is peak to average ratio, just because those are sort of like grid or, or you know, distribution rele relevant um, indicators. Um, so let me walk you through some of the results or I mean, all of the results, but, you know, one by one, um, very rather generally generically so we have three colors the green is a time of use tariff so that's that's our, our reference sort of like what the buildings with the batteries would do if you optimize them for the for the usage and we compare it to the baseline that has no battery so that's just the general you know demand of those buildings that they have that's the black line here and so you see the green time of use tariff increases electricity a little bit you know on average uh, in, in the homes five percent um, and it reduces electricity costs a little bit by 5%. And this is also what the report found uh, saying, you know, the costs, uh, you will never get back because, you know, the, the, the ROI is rather long if you only, you know, win 5% over time. So that, that kind of like sealed the deal on, on batteries at the time. This is also a few years ago, right? But if you look at what you can do if you optimize a little bit, and this probably also applies for any other method, not necessarily RL, right? If you have perfect knowledge, the orange bars, you know, 20, 15% reduction of the, of the energy demand, 20% compared to the time of use tariff, or 20% reduction of the cost compared to the baseline and, uh, you know, 15 compared to the time of use tariff. So that's, that's pretty good in comparison. And the one where you transfer learn, so where you learn a little bit on one building and then deploy on the other one is still pretty good and still better than the time of use tariff individually. So that's, those are pretty cool results um, at that point showing that you, know, you can really um, pull out something. I wanna remind you that these are buildings that are built at the same time, probably by the same crew to the exact same standard. So a lot of the variation that you'll see or a lot of the flexibility that you see in individual buildings are due to individual occupant behavior. And so that's really what you see here. So all of these, uh, all of these controllers really, really manage to tease out individualities in the, in the building loads. So I'll show you that in a little bit, but just remind yourself that. That, that that is that is the flexibility in the uh, residential homes that I was talking about that we're trying to that we're trying to tease out. So we can go down if your energy demand is you know reduced, the carbon emissions are about at the same. So you know more uh, more sustainable operation. Zero net energy that's a tough one. I think this is a monthly uh, monthly average. So that's still not quite there yet. Um, you know that. That's just what it is with that grid at that point. So improving the grid will improve that um, pretty well. Then the grid indicator is quite interesting. So the average daily peak, this is what the utilities are interested in, right? With the time of use tariff, peak goes up. This is because every single building does the same thing. And this will be important. I'll come back to this later. Whereas if you have a little bit of flexibility, you can actually learn to what the individual buildings want and then be a bit more flat and actually reduce the daily peak 15 percent you know 15 percent compared to sorry 25 percent compared to the baseline almost 30 percent compared to the time of use tariff rbc that's pretty significant and and you know those who are in the like, like distribution part in that should be like oh this is interesting um ramping is the worst um, as you can imagine again if all the buildings do the same thing this is horrible because then everybody will charge at the same time, discharge at the same time. Your ramping will be even worse. And so this is a like an unintended effect that you can have if you're optimizing on time of use, if your time of use is not reflective. So a lot of there's a lot of work going into doing dynamic pricing. I have to admit I don't understand a lot. I'm a little bit worried that it's kind of like can result in exactly something like this again. So that's why I talk a lot more about energy, electricity, carbon emissions, rather than you know money, uh, just because you can see here exactly that. You try to optimize the money, but it's not well done and you're off the chart. 
the same thing happened. Uh, there's a study, the same thing happened with smart thermostats for heating. Um, if they all collectively decide that we need to turn on heating in the morning, the, the grid goes through the roof. So this all calls for thinking about this aggregated load and you know making sure that yes, batteries can help, smart thermostats can help, but if they all do the same thing at the same time, we're in a big trouble. Um, so that that's kind of like one thing I want I want you to take away from here. And the load factor didn't really change, so I'll not talk about it. Essentially, you reduce the peak and you reduce the average, so so both go down. And so hopefully that that's probably the explanation explanation for that. So if you want to see the things that I that I just mentioned in um, you know in, in writing or in, in data, sort of like curves. So these are the individual load profiles in the homes sort of like on an average. Um, the black is the reference, the red is the rule-based controller, the time of use tariff, and the green uh, is the, the smart controller, the RL controller. And so you can see that some of these buildings have very distinct use profiles. If you compare one to four, one has a big dip in the morning and a big peak in the afternoon or late evening or early evening. Four, you know, goes down slowly and then small ramp up and no peak in the afternoon. Um, you know, 12 and five, are just messed up. You can ignore those. So, like this, you know, nothing really interesting. You know, individually, you can look at this. Like, yeah, it makes sense. But if you aggregate them, that's when the the mess is a lot more visible. So again, if all the buildings charge at the same time, this is the net load after they use their solar. And of course, you could you know regulate this a little bit, but this is the extreme case. So if everybody charges at the same time throughout the same period. The, the, the net peak increases actually in this case. Um, and then of course the ramping, you'll have it um, a little bit later on um, or, or it, it will not really help you, right? So that, that's really, really the problem. You're shifting the peak, but you're not really providing any uh, flexibility. Whereas if you look at the green curve, that's the aggregated load of all the buildings um, from this neighborhood. And if you look at that green curve, and you remember the blue curve that I showed you at the beginning from the DOE report. And if you can't remember, I'll show it to you here again. Um, if you look at this curve here and the green one, you see that we're getting there. We're getting at unlocking that particular flexibility of generating more you know, continuous load, generating lower load, smaller ramping, <clears throat> um, generally smaller peak in that residential neighborhood. And what is really interesting uh, this is really only about occupancy and occupant behavior. Uh, all the buildings are the same. Um, so assuming they're all built the same, we haven't verified, but assuming they have been all built to the same standard, they're all in the same climate, they're all in the same neighborhood, probably built by the same crews. Um, really, really, it's in occupant behavior. So there's quite a lot of flexibility in occupant behavior uh, with respect to grid interaction. And and you can see I'm very excited because remember what we did here is we matched the net load of the building. So technically every single thermostat and cooling system was running exactly as it was run before. All we did was to take the electricity at different times from different places, right? So there is no reduction, assuming everybody was comfortable with their loads at the time shown, they would have the exact same situation, right? So that that is also something that, um, you know, want to point out. Maybe some of this was already some sort of individual, you know, behavior and, you know, California has a flex call, so maybe they reduce some, sometimes their own loads. I cannot tell, <clears throat> but what I can tell is that the aggregated load over time uh, show that there is so much flexibility without the need to actually coordinate them. This was just by optimizing for their own behavior, and that's really cool. And so, really bullish on this idea and you know interested in exploring this further. So that's kind of like what we're doing. A few weeks ago, actually 10 days ago, um, like I said, I don't understand a lot about economics um, and how this plays into it, but we know that you know integrating a lot of renewables into the grid will cause transmission and distribution problems. So these smart people here, I don't know if they're smart. Anyway, Bradle report compared this sort of behavior, what I just described, is virtual power plants in the homes with deploying more power plants or grid scale batteries. And so 
you can see that the advantage is not so much in providing more energy, that's the green part, but the advantage is to reducing costs in distribution and transmission and emissions, right? And so that all added up and it's actually cheaper <clears throat> to work with this sort of approaches, whether it's what I showed now or other, there's very cool other stuff happening, but unlocking this flexibility has so much potential on the residential that, that it's just something that we have to do. It's an absolute no brainer uh, to, to go down further this road, right? It's not easy, but it's a very clear pathway. There's indications from different areas, right? Okay. Um, so this was the second part. So hopefully it is exciting. And so hopefully you're excited to go more. And so I wanna show you what, what we've been working on since then. So those results I just showed you were, you know, December. And so over the last year or so, we've been working on some more, some more cooler stuff, uh, more exciting stuff, um, if you will. So let's start with what I just showed you. So I showed you, you know, we have CityLearn, we can, we can throw in control agents <clears throat> and, and we can, you know, extrapolate or, or pull out these KPIs, any other KPIs that you want, you can throw at it. Um, and we'll be able to, to exaggerate, uh, pull it out. At the same time, um, you know, sometime in the fall of 2019, I'm listening to this talk by Eric, um, and, and I don't remember where I, you know, one of the national labs, big DOE project, putting together end user load profiles for all of the US. Not only that, it comes nicely packaged uh, in open studio models and G plus models. And so we can basically have a huge database that we can query and figuring out, um, uh, you know, figuring out sort of what uh, we want a representative home like we had in California, give us a representative energy loads or energy plus model uh, with, you know, the typical loads for that home. So we started thinking, right, so this is cool. Um, obviously, if you have that kind of database, you can, you can enhance it with other stuff, right? I mean, it could be thermostat work has been done a lot, so we can... In, of course, implement that, so have some realistic, it could be behavior, weather, you know, emission forecasts, all kinds of grid, grid emission forecasts, uh, climate change forecasts, all of that you can, you can pull into one. And so it would be really cool if you could take this sort of demand side that is very, very new and very specific to everywhere into the US and put it together with, uh, so with the control side that we've been working on. <clears throat> that I showed you results, in which case we could have really interesting sort of like representative results of this behavior that I just showed you in that one particular problem, right? So luckily, uh, one of our collaborators in Italy uh, put together cool work where he took out, remember the big challenge we have is that we cannot, we, we will not be able to run dynamic simulations for thermal, uh, thermal loads because we were fixed with the demand side. So one of our collaborators, this is um, Dr. Capozzoli's group in, in Torino, um, they worked out a methodology where they took Energy Plus models and ran and fitted um, neural network dynamic models, long short-term memory models, LSTMs, to partial load situations. And so they validated and, and worked this out. And so you can run now partial load models uh, with dynamic systems within CityLearn. Uh, which is what they shown, you know, two years ago. So then we said, well, here we have a lot of energy plus models. Here we have a way to create some cool dynamic models rather quickly. And by the way, you could do it the other way, but we, we, we chose this way. So that way we should maybe be able to create something that's really cool and connect everything together, right? So over the year, last you know, 12 months or so, big group got together and on various capacity and you know, advisory beta testing, driving. I, I want to highlight really three people, um, Kingsley from my group who took the lead and the charge to put this together, um, Catherine from Concordia with, with Mohamed Uf's group, and then Giacomo Buscemi, who was in, in Alfonso's group, Capazzoli's group. And so they, they really worked this out, connected the databases um, together. And so this week, um, two days ago, we released a new beta um, of CityLearn, which now allows you to do the load shedding that I mentioned in the beginning that we cannot do, amongst other things. So there's a lot of novel stuff that went into it, but this is sort of like the, the biggest sort of like novel team what we should be able to do now. And what is more interesting than that, to some extent, is that everything is now 
linked together. So now you can go all the way from individual homes and individual people behavior in that home aggregated across large number of buildings, arbitrarily large, typical neighborhood for any area in the US and see how that aggregates to the grid level or distribution level better. And what the impact has if you have different controllers in each home, if you have different occupant behavior in each home, if you keep adding uh, stuff to it, if you add EV, how does that change it? <clears throat> you know, and all these kind of things, right? So really, um, this is usually how I look when I talk about it. I hope you can see. It. So everything all in this connected, right? And you can go in from individual occupant behavior to the aggregated load in the neighborhood and understand the impact of individual steps. And now we can do it representative for um, around the US basically, which is really cool, right? <clears throat> so if you wanna get started, it's also pretty easy, 18 lines of code. Um, and then five of those or six of those are just installed. So it's really just 12 lines. So there's nothing you should, you know, waiting for, uh, nothing you can wait for. Um, you can get started. <clears throat> this is, you know, fresh. This week, we pushed a beta um, release uh, online, somewhat in anticipation of today, but also because we're ready to go. So hopefully you can, you can enjoy it. In the meantime, um, obviously a lot of people have been using CityLearn um, for various things, which is pretty cool. Uh, some are more related to building district, you know, heating, cooling. Others are more related to computer science problems, um, you know, because itself, the environment is actually pretty cool and challenging so you can explore other things like how you know again just data how much data do you need how safe you are and things like that i want to highlight one work uh, so i'm winding down now at the end of my talk maybe have four or five minutes um one one work that, that i want to highlight is out of the university of cambridge dr chowdhury's group um, within the annex 37 project so they are using city learn with their own campus data of the University of Cambridge, uh, I think like, I don't remember how many buildings, but you can get the electricity loads and they don't care about RL. In fact, they're using MPC for the controller, but they still use this framework because so it's used and it was so easy to integrate with their data. What they're interested in, which I find very intriguing is, um, as I mentioned, the MPC need a forecast and the quality of that forecaster um, you know, matters. And part of that forecast is often an energy forecast. So not so much weather, but more like an energy forecast in the next step or a solar forecast. And so they will be exploring how the quality of the that forecast and, you know, how the data quality leading to that forecast impacts the behavior of the MPC, whether that, that even matters or not. And so that that's pretty exciting um, to see. And, and the reason I threw this in here is because I don't want you to go away from this presentation and say, oh, this guy talks about RL and that's not going to work anyway. No, you can work. If you want to do rules, you can do rules. If you want to explore NPCs, you work NPCs. We build it with the interface so that it's useful to anybody with any approach um, simply. And that that's, that's the approach. So I'm interested in RL. That's why I used RL, but nobody else has to use RL and you can still use it, which is cool. Um, you may have heard of, of this that we did. <clears throat> so we, we are liking, um, we, we are, um, we are, you know, we are liking the idea of everybody using it, but liking the idea of competitions. So we have this city learn challenge over the last two or three years. Um, and so today I got notification that we will be able to do it again next year. So, you know, another news for, for this, this call. So we'll have it this year again, slightly different from last year, different data set, different challenge, of course. But, you know, looking forward, looking forward to that. Um, and then we do have activities, uh, like I said, still in challenge. We had a tutorial at Eckler and we'll have a summer school event, uh, the Climate Change AI group. Um, within the BIPs, I have a workshop accepted uh, at BS23 uh, for this topic. So if you're interested, um, you know, in a few months, still interested in, <laughs> Uh, feel free to show up. Um, the tutorial, if you Google it, it's available as a collab. Um, and so you can you can go ahead and, and um, work through it. It's, it's self-paced. It's slowly ex you know working through the example. If you were at this climate change tutorial, summer schools last year, they had Bob test. So it's kind of like filling in that, that uh, same, same topic again. So with that, um, I'll come to an end.
and I'll leave this up. This is the summary of what we had. If you want, if you know, if you don't get your question answered today, feel free to get in touch and check out our other work on YouTube. Um, and otherwise, just you know, try it out. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so I see a few questions. Let me take them. I'll, I'll take a sip out of water. I was gonna uh, forward you the questions. Would you like me to read them out loud for the? I can read them. Sure. There is one in the Q and A. It says, with the new changes to Citroen V two, it is no longer model three. It now supports meta model based RL. Is that correct understanding? So. Um, yes and no. What a model-free RL would mean that in your RL algorithm you use the model. Um, what we did was just to replace the dynamics with a model, but it's not necessarily used in the RL. So we could have used like an RC model um, to just simulate the dynamics as well. And depending on how you use your uh, algorithm, whether or not you use the model to forecast, for example, that makes it model or not model-free. So you could have done that before too, basically. What I'm saying. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. And then there is another question in the chat. Can City Learn be applied for building energy simulation and optimization? Oh, that's a tough. <laughs> well, so we're not. Um, in, in, so it's not a replacement for Energy Plus. If that's that's what the question is about, it's more about. If you do have a given model or a given sort of like, here's my building in operation or here's my simulation model that I have, I can explore how control will impact the operation. The, the design is always for peak loads, right? So what you can do with control is you can understand how off-peak design will be, or off-peak operations is intended or how you can shift the loads um, for those. Um, there is, so if you're interested to link it directly with Energy Plus, like I said, Bob test is probably a lot closer. There is a plethora of works over the last two or three years that have done Energy Plus co-simulation with gym environments. So I don't even know, like in the paper, we put these like five or six, um, you know, works that have done Energy Plus co-simulation environments with gym to do that and we would stay away for that particular reason. I don't know if that answered the question. Um, yes, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it answers the question, but maybe uh, hopefully that does. Um, now let's see, there is one hands up. Karem. <clears throat> the, that's a question. There's a hands up. Oh, allowed to talk. Oh, there you go. Right. Go ahead, Karim. Okay, um, I'll take another question in the meantime. Maybe Karen, maybe you can type your question um, just in case. Um, Elias says, "Has your have we looked at combined control of multiple buildings with the aim to limit load, et cetera, or are the controls in each individual buildings only? No, we have done, so some of our works uh, and we call it Marlisa algorithm. Uh, we we looked at that um, and how you could coordinate loads between the buildings with the with the intent to reduce the combined uh, effect. So we have done that. Other people have done that too. So if you're interested, really, the, I like uh, I just said, I'm I'm organizing this workshop over the past three years, RLM, and uh, all the content is still there, I think, and it's also on YouTube. You can look at them. There have been some works on that. I think one of the national labs used it to learn to explore it also. Um, so that's, you know, if you're interested in related works to this particular topic, um, you're welcome to, uh, you know, browse the RLM workshop, you know. Okay, and then there is a comment. Is there a tutorial more on the technical details and the technical design? There is no tutorial, but there is an archive paper um, where we summarize it. One second, let me, let me pull that up. It's a great question. Um, it's a, I'm not sure if it's outdated or not. It's somewhat there. Yeah. 
if while you, Zoltan is pulling up the paper, uh, if any one of you want to have an interactive question session, you could just raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk um, or ask more clarification questions. Thank you. Yeah. And I put the put the link in the chat <clears throat> to that to that standardizing paper. It's it's a few years old, so you know, few things have changed over the time, uh, but the general idea is still there. <clears throat> you can you can take a look. What suggestion to someone who wants to learn to, to learn applied for building level control? Um, are you so building level control? Are you, are you suggesting multi zones? We haven't done multi zone yet, but you can do individual buildings. So just because I talked about many buildings, it's perfectly perfectly okay to just use one building. Um, the only thing that right now is, you know, limitation or not limitation, but but feature, you know is that we assume single zone building. So, so it works obviously very well for, for residential single family homes, but some of our earlier work, you know, did multifamily, multifamily buildings with where we assumed it's a single zone, right? And it's an simplification you can make. It's only the question is what you compare it to, right? Um, at the end of the day with other people's work, like you can do the sub zone control right now. Um, have we looked at any field demonstrations of RL? And if yes, were there any comfort issues during the learning phase? So that is a good question. I have not personally looked into it. However, who has done quite a lot of interesting work in field studies is ORNL, um, Hilia Zandi and uh, Kuldeep. Kort was not there anymore, but they have done quite a bit of work on, on you know, thermal ways and implementations um, and, and real world sort of like challenges um, for this work. And normally, normally there, there, there could be uh, discomfort challenges, um, you know, and, and sometimes, like I said, you, there are ways for practically limiting these things, right? So you can always put like boundaries that some people call them guide rails to avoid that things go completely crazy. And it's kind of like a hard over, 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 charge or like a, a hard guardrail, so to speak, a hard barrier for the controllers to go completely crazy. <clears throat> um, sometimes you you do what we did here, right? So in in, our, in the simulations, at least, we didn't see complete craziness if you jumpstart with the RBC, right? And then you're not too far off. <coughs> so if two more minutes, any last questions? Uh, last year, there was a competition using CityLearn. Will similar challenge be organized this year? Yes. Um, we just received two things. Um, today, I received notification that NURPS has accepted it as a challenge officially. And last week, I got notification of a small grant that will allow me to do it. So if anything goes wrong, uh, well and the grant is you know arrives in my account, then we can do something very similar to last year. Not what we did last year, but something different so it's more challenging thank you and i hope you all participate <laughs> we also got a sponsor for prize money so it, all the components are there we just need to execute them cool. i think it's time to wrap up um so thank you dr negi for um wonderful presentation and uh, answering the questions. Um, thanks everyone for joining IBIPSA um, USA webinar. And if you would like to enjoy or consider joining the IBIPSA USA webinar working group, please um, use the email in the chat box to email us, reach out to us. And for those who are watching on YouTube, uh, please like the video and subscribe to our channel to be aware of the upcoming webinars. So thank you. Thank you, everyone.